So I think everyone is here who like, who like to listen for this talk. So we will start. My name is Yuri. I'm working for Lazada, and I did uh, log delivery pipeline for Lazada for last year, and that's the place where I got a lot of uh, experience with Ersys Log. So I have no straight uh, relation with this Ersys Log project, but uh, because of working with it, I filled a lot of issues and I contributed some, some patches to Ersys Log, so I'd like to share my experience and how to use it properly, maybe a few ideas around that. So let's start. Uh, so this is actually what people usually think about Ersys Log. So it's some kind of black magic uh, which can transfer your syslog, which is written to devlog, or to EDP port 514 to some logs or to some remote host. Uh, well, there is a bit more. What actually Ersys Log says it is? Uh, well, so they have a lot of inputs, they have a lot of outputs, and they can do some some changes in in the middle. Uh, what's the uh, actual magic uh, behind that? Uh, so we have inputs, we have queues, we have parsers, we can do some transformation, and we can put it to output. Uh, and here is uh, rule sets. So, as you might remember, there was no rule set before, but it was changed somewhere in 2010, maybe. Uh, so now you can have rule set, multiple rule sets, not just one. And why is good? Because you can do things like that. You can connect. Uh, so, in in default case, when you have just one rule set, it's one one pipeline, one stream, one stream. You can, you should do this. Uh, you should check on every me on every message. You should check well what this message about. What this message is about. Is it from this program or is it from this input or is it from that file? And then you can do some decision. When you have multiple rule sets, you can do you can bind input straight to that rule set. So you don't need to check. It will save you some time it, uh, and it will save you some code so you don't need to write some complex logic it's really great here and yeah when you look on this configuration you may ask well is it rcs log at all because i know that it's some ugly strings around uh, rcs log conf what's this about how can i use this modern syntax uh, well it's actually here for a while as i told from 2010. Uh, so Ersyslog have three configuration formats for Ersyslog.conf and more. Uh, so you can use, you can still use old syslog that uh, syscalogd format, which well we have some pattern here, and when it matched, we will send this message to this file. But it's really for simple cases because when you need complex logic, you cannot use it anymore. For that, previously was introduced that ugly syntax, which is fortunately now obsoleted. So you don't need to write all that ugly strings anymore. Please don't use it. It will break your life. Use Reiner script, which is now called it advanced syntax. And all samples I will show later are in a Reiner script, actually. So let's check for another thing, uh, it's queues. So queues is most confusing part of first slow configuration because when you need to, con to understand that, well, I have that amount of inputs, I, every input produces some amount of message, how much, how long queue I need to be able to, uh, to survive if I have some latency and I have some delays on my uh, output channels. And yeah, it's really hard, and I will not describe how to do it because there is documentation on site. So I I will talk only about things which is not clear in documentation here. So queues recite 
you can attach queue in two places, which is already confusing. You can have rule set queue, uh, this place where message hit when you got when, when you got it from input. And you can have action queue. This uh, is queue uh, which message will hit inside of rule set before going to some output. Uh, both of them are usable. They behaving a bit differently, but well, they are usable. Let's say. <laughs> okay, and every queue operating in four modes. First one is no queue actually. So it's queue in direct mode when message appears on input, it will stri go straight to uh, to output or to roll set that the processor. So there is no actual queuing happens. But this mode have one big uh, one big difference. It's done in synchronous way. So when your action or yeah when you put it to some action and your action change that uh, message, this is the only way when you can uh, go later with different actions uh, and have that modified uh, message inside of that. Because elsewhere, in all other modes, there will be just copy of message done. So you can change it, but rest of outputs will not see that change. So if you need to change to modify some message, you should use direct queue mode. So for rest, I think in memory and on disk, I never used on disk queue, well, because usually it's a good idea to use in memory queue because it's fi much faster. And if you, if you, your amount of messages is uh, so long, so you, and so big, and you need some persistence for that, then it's better to use that combined mode, disk assisted. So a few words about performance. Uh, this is, well, this set of uh, ideas how to tune your rule set queue or action queue. So first one, if you, if you realize that your message processing is not so fast as you expect, then it's better always try to increase amount of workers of rule set queue because in that case it can parallelize that rule sets processing. It, it's actually uh, instantiate multiple rule set and feed them with messages but you should uh, understand that in that case you cannot predict output order of messages. That drawback of that. So if you still not enough, if you're speed is still not enough, you can try to increase action queue amount, action queue workers amount. But, well, because action queue, action processing is, so, uh, is about string building, so that templating thing. We got some message, we do some changes, we produce string and put it to output. Uh, so there is not so big benefit of that. If you have heavy string processing, yes, then we will have some profit. But usually just two workers is enough. In really rare, rare case, you can have more. For things like reading to file, it's not usually a good idea to increase workers amount. Because, well, you need to log file. Log, I mean. Uh, because m when multiple trades, trying to write the same file, well, you need to do something with that. And that overhead will eat all your profit from that. So maybe you can check, uh, maybe it's better to use some OM, OM file settings, tune that output. Well, for single action trade, rule set is uh, it's more complicated and it's better to read this link that documentation about this because there are much more details so you can find it later in slides and let's go to modern world now so that before I, I was talking about RCS log things so now let's ha let's check how we can use it in real world in modern world 
uh, well, usually what LK is actually stack uh, people usually using in in production right now. And here I summarize it: what uh, what steps are done during processing of measures. And so yeah, let's have a look how, how we can change it with services log. So let's meet ERK stack. You can see that, yes, we can still read messages from file or network by using stock inputs. We can still parse it using that modes, that, that modules. And so it looks like we can use everything. We can do everything here. So let's check how, how exactly we can do that. Uh, the really unique feature of rsyslog is a mem normalized module, which is using libloc norm, which is using parse 3. It's not grog, it's not regex. That's why it's amazingly fast. When this was actually one of selling point of versus log uh, when we trying to choose what, what we will use in our, log, in our log delivery pipeline. Because we need to parse our log messages. We have some standard about logging and there is strict uh, format. So we need to be able to parse them fast because we are doing it well. We are logging a lot. And I can say now that this is really great thing. So if you need to parse a lot of message, you can consider using MM normalize in RSS log. Uh, I will show some some rules, how it works. So this is example of a rule set file, and you can see that, well, part after first colon is just message, usually. So my auth API is part of message. Uh, so we're just writing uh, message, how is it, and replacing few placeholders by using, for example, that a user colon world means that we will we expect an a field user, which will be a world, is some space separated set of chars. And uh, that SRC IP is expected to be an IPv4 address. And you can see that there is two formats which actually match, uh, but second one is a bit different. We added a PID, which is number. And what will happen if we dis when message got into that rules, in the MM normalize, it will check them from first to second, so in order of uh, rules appears, which means you can shave migration of uh, log format easily. You don't need to write complex configuration. You can just add another rule, which will, which will be matched, and you can even understand which exactly uh, rule, which which rule exactly was matched by that first part after uh, equation sign, that V0 and V1, you will have it in spatial field. So you can check, yeah, in that case I got a message in this uh, format, in another case I got message in this format, and if you're collecting them, for example, to Kibana, you can check how much uh, message were in old format and how much message are in new format, so you can do some you can understand how much API, for example, migrated to new format. Uh, and there is two ways to send it further as JSON. First one is by directly modifying JSON objects and put it, well, to rely on rsyslog actually. So we're doing some magic with uh, fields and after that we are just sending that full JSON object. Uh, well, unfortunately, do we have some laser point? No? Well, okay. So, guys, then I need to explain it. Ah, yeah, I think I can use some magic by Apple. Yeah, I can. <laughs> well, it's not open source, but still good. Uh, okay, so you can see this part means that rsyslog have some variables and this is predefined variable which consists of all that json with, which is actually in json format and 
keeping all fields of message. So when you go to parse it, you will save every variable here, every variable from your message here. So what we are doing below, that uh, said log time means actually we will change format of field to be RFC 339. And we can unset fields by using unset tag. So I'm doing a renaming of field here. Well, it's not really usable, but and I'm doing unset of field here. And then I just throw in all JSON which we have to do Elasticsearch. And well, there is another another way to do the same when we produce a template which will keep all fields we need. So we prepare in JSON in this case. Bef uh, in previous uh, case, we just operate in variables. In this case, we operate in template. So we just enlisting all fields we need to produce. And then just using it to send data to Elasticsearch. OK, so let me cancel this. OK. So another topic is reliable uh, delivery. Mm, you all know that UDP, there is joke about UDP, but you may don't, <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> well, and actually there is the same about TCP, but it's a bit different. Uh, you can lose your message when it's delivered by UDP or TCP. Differences, well, for UDP you will lose it much frequently. Uh, so there is another another thing is RILP, which is a protocol. Um, it's like TCP syslog, syslog over TCP, I mean, but with confirmation from from another side. Uh, this have well, it's understandable that is great because well now we have delivery, which is which will happen always. But there is drawbacks, as you can understand, because you need to, to receive uh, confirmation from that side, which will reduce your bandwidth. And there is another, well, yeah, as a bonus, you, got, you get easily configurable TLS. Uh, but another drawback is single treated. So it looks really great when you read in documentation, but when you're starting to use it on high volume, high bandwidth logging, you realize that, wow, we hit on a single CPU core and we cannot get more. That's why we decided, well, it, it's not actually bad if we will lose one message sometimes and switch to TCP. But RELP is great. It's still great. So if you have some financial data in logs maybe, which is wrong idea, but still. So it's better to use RELP. And if you need to configure TLS, Again, it's much easier to do with real than using all that internal things of first log. So now we have reliable delivery. How we can understand that this works good? Log have metrics. Uh, it has built-in module which acts as input, which is actually means you can use anything which you can use with any other input. So you can you can uh, transform that messages, you can use different templates, or you can do some internal counters. So feel free to do that. Uh, here is an uh, example of logging in JSON format. Uh, but by default, that uh, input produces plain messages, but you can use configuration changes to ask the, this model to produce JSON. We are using JSON. and well, I will not explain every counter here. You can read that documentation. And if you, it's not enough for you, you can create dynamical states. For example, here you can see the uh, counter, bunch of counters, I'd say, which will be increased on every new message with hostname. So when I re receive a message, it check for hostname and then increase a prep that uh, counter of message per this host name exactly. So you can see 
there is example of output when you have few lab machines and there is how it looks and such statistics output. So we found it's great. We did the same for API. So we have statistic how much message produced by a single API if we have, even if we have a bunch of APIs running on the same host. Okay. And there is lookup tables, which is really great. For example, if you'd like to, well, if there is any postmaster here or guys who, un or guys who understand how firewalls, uh, firewalls works, then you understand how good uh, lookup tables. Uh, the good point behind that is you can reload them. So you don't need to restart whole RC's log. You need, don't need to, to stop it and to start it. You can just reload single hookup table when you, when you, don't, when you need to change some, some processing. So this is configuration, actually. So we can see that there is file, JSON file, which actually holds that, that table. And reload on hub means that this table will be reloaded when RC's log got hub sign all. And then you can do something. You can even do call indirect by combining strings and it will act like go to that business unit A, business unit B, or if there is unknown state, the business unit unknown. So it's some kind of switch construction here. And yeah, you can even reload it from Rhino script, uh, which is uh, not obvious way to use, but it got me another idea. I thought, well, if we can do things by receiving message, maybe we can do even more. And actually we can. So if you are using HA proxy, for example, you know you can configure it by using that Unix socket interface. So there is special interface for that. You can do something similar by using RCS log, actually. So here you can see that we create an input socket by in this path. And we, when we got some message, for example, if this message is reload BU, this table got reloaded. And if this message is run CMD, we will put that message into action OMPROC, which start program and receive that message on SDD in. And that looks great. So we can use it for some, by some ways, which is not expected, usually. By, again, I, once I have used it to bring interface up, uh, well, we had some server with some, some semi-broken firmware on some NIC interface. Uh, so I used the RCS log to bring it up when it goes down. And it was, it was working. It's not usual way, but you still can do that. So um, actually, I'm over of, I'm out of ideas. So you can ask me some questions. Uh, well, and actually, I'm ahead of time a bit. Yeah. We are not using Logstash now. Yeah, so our pipeline looks, well, actually we are not using Kibana as well. We are using Greylog. But I'd like to throw it away. Uh, well, from my perspective right now, ideal pipeline sounds like, well, we receiving a lot of message to RCS log, delivering it by RCS log to some relay host, then delivering it to pairs host, which again have RCS log, which feeding message into Elasticsearch cluster directly. You can do the same with RCS log actually. You can, there is, there are um, modules to append Geo IP data for example to, so from first sight it looks like RCS log can cover at least 80% of your needs from uh, Logstash. The only problem there is actually clusterization because you can, you, when you have Logstash, you can just say, well, I have cluster of Logstash, please use it. 
for RCS lock, you, you still need to think about uh, that H high availability and how to do load balancing. But it's yeah, that's possible. But I see no point to use lock stash for that. Usually, you can do the same using RCS lock now. Well, I, I guess there are still cases when Logstash is better, but well, for us, RCS log is just enough. And we do an actual parsing right on server when our API runs, and it took just few CPU percent because it's C++. It's running, it's a even C maybe, so it's running pretty fast. You don't need to run to fire that Java to take care about memory, so it's amazing. And modern versions of RCS log uh, act even better because they did some coverity scan and fixed a lot of bugs because of that. And I'd say it's pretty good now. I cannot compare between RCS log and syslog and G because I have no experience with syslog and G. But I say if I will dig by the same level of depth I did for RCS log, I will find a lot as well. Okay, any other question? We can be a bit relaxed with time because there's now no other session until after lunch. So I, I have a question, but I'll certainly leave it to the audience first. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so asking about, is it possible to do a loop in our system? Mm, well, you can configure it this way, I'd say. <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, good point, by the way, because we just got once a problem when our pipeline was full of messages, so it's stuck on receiving side, and this means that your API cannot write anymore. We are using uh, Unix circuit for that, and yeah, everyone hit into the same problem. When I see anyone, any users of any log delivery pipeline, they hit onto this problem then. Because when your pipeline full, when every queue is full, yeah, you go. But we decided, well, we can throw messages in that case on API level, and we can throw that message in this way. So any new message which come into RCS log is just drop it if queue is full. So you can configure it in this way as well. So we did on both ends to protect. It's rational behavior. At some point, you just can't fix the problems. You've only got so much yeah. capacity. Um, one piece of housekeeping before I ask my question. Uh, we are doing, as we have done every year, a large group photo of everyone at the conference. Uh, we strongly encourage you to come join us. That'll be at the exhibition area at 12.15. And so 